I'm uh, keeping a promise. Uh, I keep meaning to take some time out and make some more watch-related videos, and I really have been meaning to do it, but, you know, clearly it hasn't been a priority because I haven't been doing it. So I'm making it a priority, and here I am. It's been a... Aren't you tired of hearing me say it's been a long week? It's only Wednesday. Gosh, but it's been a long week. Crazy stuff. Um, just nutty stuff. Like, uh, I, this was a fun week. I, I got to restore a, a 6105 um, that had been just just had tons of water on the dial and it was just this ratty nasty mess but uh even i'm impressed with what i was able to do this is this is that same same watch and i'll uh i'll insert a picture so you can see what the dial looked like originally because it was it was gnarly anyway there it is all of its glory i'm very proud of that oh what a watch oh what a week Okay, but a question that somebody had last week, they asked me what the weirdest watch was in my collection. And it's it, it's one that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. They're pretty rare to see, uh, and they're a real oddity. Uh, and what's even stranger is that this very odd watch um, set a lot of records and had a lot of firsts, but almost no one knows about it anymore. This is the Real Synchronar. It's by um, Roger Real, R-I-E-H-L. This was the world's first solar-powered LED watch. This thing was, he had, Roger Real was one of these sort of um, visionary geniuses, but he was fixated on the idea of creating um, a, a watch that, that would that that would hit all kinds of certain benchmarks he wanted it to be incredibly rugged he wanted it to be like insanely waterproof uh temperature resistant both hot and cold shock resistant uh and and so he had brainstormed all through this idea starting in i guess around 1960 and then in the late 1960s into early 19 early early 1970s uh technology came along enough that he was able to start thinking about creating this this his his sort of dream watch, um, and it's it's pretty it's pretty wacky. These watches. Maybe I should back up and talk about what LED is versus LCD. LED came first. Before, we had LCD watches, which is a early mid seventies thing. We really they really came into their own in like seventy five seventy six, which is when these came out, and these were the first liquid quartz chronographs. This display, that was a big thing. But before that, um, the technology for light emitting diodes was uh, a big deal. This, and that came first. Um, and you may, here's an LED watch, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but still. This LED watch was made by Texas Instruments. Um, and they, of course, Texas Instruments making really nice stuff. And they, I mean, they had all their calculators. The TI 83s are, are still coveted today. Uh, and they used a lot of this, this LED technology. There it is. So it'll give us the date and the time. Uh, and it's a, it's a fine discriminating calculator, uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, and it has, this one has, um, this one actually has a trimmer in it, so you can adjust it if you have the 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 if you have the machine that's able to sense the vibrations and adjust it, like a QT99 Seiko quartz tester, like what I have. They're very cool. It's cool technology. One of the problems with LCD technology, you'll notice you press the button and it only goes on for a second, right? Boop, boop, and then it goes off. The reason for that is these things suck power like you would not even believe. They'll, this has two big 301 batteries in it, and it'll suck these things dry less than a year. Especially if you're using it a lot, it'll really, really hit on them. So, Reel's idea was that he wanted the sidestep. He wanted the watch that was basically had no, um, had no, uh, no maintenance needs whatsoever. And so, he strived to make that happen. So, let's take a break and let you look at it. Look at it really closely. Okay.
So here it is. So again, to get a closer look at this thing, here's this, this Texas Instruments. This would have been an expensive piece in its day. And there it is. This is it 624. Gosh, it's been a long day. 926. So we know the time and the date. The reason, one of the main reasons I brought this out <coughs> is because this doesn't function. So Roger Reel's idea about having a maintenance-free watch that would be good forever, which is something that he promoted in his ads for these things, unfortunately is not the case. He tested these for everything you can possibly imagine. Um, and uh, I'll tell you how that worked out. Now, the way it works, you'd think the display would be up here, but no, that, these are the solar cells in there. Maybe you can see them in there. See those? Those are the solar cells. The readout would be right here. There it is. Uh, and you can see in there, you can see the little traces of the little, the wiring and the numbers right in there. Now this is a broken LED panel, utterly, utterly broken. So you can kind of see how that looks there. And his would have, is a much cruder version of this in here because they were essentially handmade. So what he died, decided to do, the way he wanted to deal with this, he wanted a watch that was incredibly durable, shockproof, heatproof. And the way he did that was by basically not having to, the problem is always is the battery. The second problem is the controls. So we have batteries that are going to pull a ton of power. You have to have a push button to turn the darn thing on. He got around that in two ways. Got around the batteries by the solar power. They got around the controls by using magnets, he achieved the depth ratings and the shock ratings. I mean, crazy depth ratings, 750 feet, um, sh crazy shock ratings, um, where he would have a, he would put these things on a trip hammer and drop them a thousand times from like five feet up. Um, and they wouldn't break. They have these things, they have <clears throat> they can withstand up to 5,000 G's. If you, that, that's what he claimed, 5,000 G's. And the way he did that was he made this module with all the wiring, and then what he did is he sealed it completely with Lexan, the entire inside. This is a solid module, solid module. So in order to have control over it, you have these, these little switches here. These things underneath them, they have a magnet and the magnet can go through this plastic, this Lexon, and it, uh, it activates little leaf spring switches on the inside. But the piece itself is completely, um, it's completely, uh, sealed. Now the problem is of course, is that the cells, the rechargeable cells, there are two of them in here. Um, is they leak. And so these things, they, they just, they fail after a while. Um, I've never seen one working. This is the second one I've owned. Neither has worked. This is, there were four versions that he made of this. The first ones, when things were going really well, before the LCD thing came along, were sort of high-end pieces. And uh, he, he didn't really spare any expense with them. When the Quartz Revolution came along, what he decided that he needed to do was to start doing some cost saving. The first ones, this was a metal strap here. Then he decided to cut materials costs, and this was gone. And this is a little Lexan rod. He sort of stuck into this groove right here where the metal would have been just to sort of disguise it. This is called the Sunwatch variant. And then the, the last variant, this was just a smooth window. There was nothing here at all. So the key to restoring one of these and I've I've never tried <clears throat> can't imagine I ever will is you have to uh let's open this up and let's actually pull out that module let's see if I can do this while looking through my phone hang on just one second there we go there's one and there's two okay so let's put that bracelet away so here it is you could see you have the module and then just this plain framework. It's a very simple idea. Here are the switches. You can, you can see them right here and they just, they're sort of spring loaded and you can just drive them back and forth like this. And we take them out and there's the, the magnet that's, sw that swings back and forth there. And that tells us that operates the switches.
it's a pretty cool design. And so there it is. You can see the entire module sealed. <coughs> Pardon me. Now these are, I mean, they're interesting. At this point, when he had the first and the second generations, they were being made professionally by uh, in with a company in New Jersey. By the time three and four happened, he was basically, he that company had gone under because of the quartz revolution. And he had bought out all the stock and was more or less assembling these in his home. This version, this Mark III, would have been made around 1977. He made them until about 1982, 1983. He was going to make a Mark V version, but then he passed away in the mid-2000s. But he had all kinds of ideas. These things were incredibly accurate. They were the first... Um, the first digital watch of any kind to automatically account for leap years. They were good to four seconds a year accuracy. I mean, they did some amazing stuff. There's even more beyond that. I mean, basically impervious to shock, impervious to heat, impervious to cold, impervious to, to G-forces. And they were pretty wacky looking. If only one could repair them. If they weren't permanently sealed. The way you work on these is you have to apparently. You can see this seam right here. It goes all the way around. You have to cut that off. Open it up. Get out the get out the old dead circuits that are in there. And then hope like hell that the battery acid didn't destroy the watch. Because believe me, battery acid will do a number. This one had battery acid in it. See right there? And it ate the whole circuit. It did it went it was so bad it actually it degraded the this thing that it's in here. Battery acid. So it'd be super cool if it worked. But it doesn't. But I don't know. Someday maybe when I know more I'll I'll pull this thing apart and see if we can get it working. Because I think that'd be pretty pretty neat. Pretty nifty thing in terms of pure functionality. And you know, we want to talk about how neat you know, the horology is the study of timekeeping and you want to have really accurate timekeeping, right? Really super duper accurate timekeeping. Well, here it is. This thing could, you know, on paper is almost a perfect watch. If it hadn't had leaking batteries, if he hadn't had this, basically this, this fleeing resource that's in here, this watch, if this watch still worked, if those circuits still worked, it would be a magnificent timepiece, and it is, you have to admit, super crazy funky. Anyway, that's about it. Let me assemble it, and we'll start up again. So I have it all back together. You have to pretend that it's uh, functioning, but since it's an LED watch, you wouldn't see it working normally. You just have to pretend you see those little lights there. So it was interesting. I mean, you have you have all these different controls that it would have. Uh, you could apparently you could display date and time and seconds elapsed. Uh, the later ones had all kinds of crazy extra functionality um, that he and he had some ideas for the Mark V that were just nuts. It it really is sort of you know, it's a very clever, clever, clever design with a lot of crazy technology that went into it. It's tough to say that maybe if the you know the LCD revolution didn't happen if the liquid crystal thing didn't come along maybe these would have stayed going maybe this would have been something for the future instead of instead of the past uh there used to be his son for a while would repair these uh he is apparently no longer in business and people seem to not actually know where he is or what he's doing um there is an enthusiast group of people who collect these of course, and they um, and they restore them. But from what I'm told and what I've gathered, the Mark Threes, like this one, are just basically if they're not if they're not alive when you get them, like if you can't get them to power up even a little bit, if they're just gone, then the chances that they're going to be decent when you open them up are pretty much zero. So it's more of a curiosity. I wish it worked, but it doesn't. Maybe someday, though, technology will change and be able to get this thing working. I, 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 I wear it certainly as a conversation piece. Paul McCartney wore one apparently in 2001. That's some crazy interview. He was wearing one of these synchronars. Hosni bin Barak of uh, Egypt wore one. You know, they're super cool. Sort of a retro futuristic design. Pretty wacky. So there it is. There's the answer. The strangest watch in my collection. The real Synchronar. And this is, again, as far as I understand, this is a Mark III Sunwatch. 
That's what this is. Cool. And if anybody has any more information about these sun watches, feel free to put it down below, ask questions, whatever the heck it is. And there it is. Sun watch. Okay. Thank you so much.